I just sensed this morning that you, like me, needed that. Um, you know, with, with what's going on in the news today, what's going on in France, there is, there's just this feeling inside of us that there's a lot wrong in this world. And our hearts are heavy this morning because we see that, we see it far away in that situation. We know the lives that it's affecting, but we see it um, even in our own world and close up. And so I just thought it would only be right right now just to take a moment and just give you a moment just to calm your hearts before the Lord. Just take a moment to pray. And if you would, in this moment, pray for those who are affected by this great tragedy in France. Just take a moment and bow your head. Lord God, thank you that we can come before your eternal throne and know that you have everything under control, that you are seated on the throne, and we can call on your name right now. We call on your name for the people of France the insecurity they feel at the moment, the questions they have at the moment, the fears they have at the moment, the stuff they're having to sort through, the loss they have sustained that has touched so many. Uh, Dear God, I pray that you would work mightily through that and bring good out of such horrible things. Lord God, I want to bring each of my brothers and sisters in this room before you right now because they too have things going on in their lives that hurt so bad. And I pray that somehow your word and your book, something said from your text this morning, would minister to each one of us. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall fresh upon each person in this room. Free us from those things that are weighing us down. And the sage said so well, point our eyes back to Jesus this morning. So thank you for these moments to just shut everything off, shut everything down, and hear clearly from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I was thinking with the events of this week and all that has been going on, about those who bring such terror. My guess is you've had some responses in your own mind, some thoughts in your own mind, some opinions in your own mind. You just go, what do you do with that? It, 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 it rarely goes to praying for them. It, it normally moves towards anger and hostility and frustration and all sorts of things like that. But our text this week, we're going through the Bible and we're in the book of Romans this week. I hope you've read it this week. I hope you grabbed one of the cards in the cafe and have it on your ring, and I hope that you've been meditating on that. If not, they're out there. Go grab those. Our text this week is written by a guy who, if you had lived in that time, you would have originally known as a terrorist. You would have originally known him as one who hated and killed Christians and capture this, doing it all for his belief that it was for God. The Apostle Paul, we mentioned him last week when we were talking about Stephen being stoned, and there he is, uh, right there at the feet, seething at Stephen. And yet you remember what he saw, what he heard, the the vision of this guy that he had, this vision of Jesus that was given there. And we believe that it really stuck down deep inside of him to a point that this this would begin to work over in his brain. Because Christians, Christ followers, treated him differently 
than what he would have ever expected as he treated them the way he was treating them with such disdain and murderous death threats. On the road to Damascus, Syria, this guy Paul was stopped dead in his tracks by God himself. We had an amazing conversion, and from that moment on, nothing would ever be the same in his life again. (laughs) So much so, can you imagine him showing up to the Christians going, hey, I'm now one of you, take me in, and they're going, whoa, 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 and there's there's a lot of talk about that in the Bible and, and understanding that, but that's who you're dealing with. 25 years after this major life-changing experience on, on, that, on that road to Damascus, he sits down to pen this book entitled Romans. I hope you have it open in front of you. We're going to just start on the first page of the book of Romans. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to have a Bible there in the chairs in front of you. Grab it, open it up to the book of Romans, and um, as you do so, know that if you don't have a Bible, I want you to take that one with you. Now, if you know someone that doesn't have a Bible and they need that, that Bible that you have there, take it with them. We spend insane amounts of money on Bibles here, and we think it's worth every dollar of it. They're going out to people all the time, so just take it with you. First um, chapter of the book of Romans, in verse seven, it says this, to all of those in Rome, So it's written to the people in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Rome was in that day the center of everything, religion, politics, entertainment. It was the most debased culture that you can imagine. I am told that if you look at the very darkest parts of culture today, and most of us are aware of it, you're horrified by it, troubled by it. If you're like me, you sense that it's only getting worse and that the, the soul of our culture is rotting out. I am told that it looks like nothing compared to how awful it was in that time. In fact, 30 years after Paul would write this, Nero would would take Christians. He would attach them to poles. He would dip them in tar, and then he would place those poles with the Christians on it around his gardens and light them on fire to light his gardens and to light his parties that he would have there. This is the kind of culture that we're talking about. When Paul writes this, he knows that Christianity is just about to undergo incredible, intense persecution, that it would be outlawed, that it wouldn't even be possible to live um, out their Christian faith. In A.D. 70, the Jewish people back in Israel, were beginning to struggle under the pressure of the ever-increasing intensity of the laws just gripping them from the Roman Empire. And the Jewish people rise up in revolt. And Rome comes down to Israel, to Jerusalem, to sack that city, to destroy that city. The commander who would do that was a guy by the name of Titus. You may remember, and while Jesus walked on the earth, he said, hey, there's coming a day when, when this temple will be destroyed and not one stone will be left upon another. 
A whole lot of reasons why that seemed impossible. If you've ever seen the stones, you would see one of the reasons why. You'd be shocked that that was the case. But that's exactly what happened in A.D. 70. And as that army came upon Jerusalem and ultimately came upon the temple, evidently just even the mortar in the stones was gold. And the fire that burned softened that, and they took that gold, and they took all the riches found there, and they took them all back to Rome. And in Rome today, you will see an arch right by the Colosseum called the Arch of Titus. Titus was the commander that had um, gone down with his armies. They brought back slaves, and those slaves, um, along with the money that they had stolen, the, the wealth that they had stolen there, were used to build the Colosseum in record time thereafter. It would be in that Colosseum that the Christians, not many years later, would be thrown to the lions. And the Apostle Paul writes these words to prepare the believers for what is about to come. I read this verse to you, verse 7, a few moments ago. To those in Rome who are loved by God, I want you to hear that this morning when Paul writes to you, I believe he wants you to know you are a people loved by God, and then he says this, and who are called to be saints. We live in a place where there is a prevalent, prevailing mindset about sainthood. And it certainly would not include any of you as a saint, right? No one's voted on you yet, right? You probably don't have enough money to get into that position. You probably don't know the right people to do that. What Paul says is he writes this, and I want to point it out this morning because as we go through his letters that he writes, he writes much of the New Testament, by the way, As we go through those letters, very often you're going to find him addressing the people that he's writing to and calling the people that are put their faith and trust in Jesus, who love Jesus, calling them saints. Here's what the Word of God says. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, when God looks down on you, he sees you as righteous because of the blood of Jesus covering you. He does not see you as a sinner any longer. He sees you as righteous and he sees you as a saint. And so when Paul writes to the Christians in the churches that he's speaking to, he always looks at them and says to the saints. And so I say to you this morning, good morning, saints. Can you call me Saint Lee? <laughs> oh, well, hey, hey, that, that sounded bad. So to do this, glance out of the corner of your eye. Does that look like a saint next to you? I look at them and say, good morning, saint, and call them by your name. I mean, just, just turn to that person next to them. If they know Jesus, they're a saint. Ooh, that was weird, wasn't it? Hey, that's what your Bible says this morning. Isn't that cool? Now, when we read these books, and we're, we'll, we'll be doing this again, so you just get used to it. You're going to have to say hi to the saint next to you. So you you have to deal with that over the next weeks to come. So as we're going through these books that are to come, most of these churches, the Apostle Paul started. So he goes, he starts a church, and then when he goes away, he writes to them. And he says, hey, I'm here and this is going on. Next week, we're going to be in one of those churches when we talk about the church at Corinth, a messed up place. Okay, you want to hear about messed up people? You know, that that always makes you feel better because you're you're kidding me. We're going to be talking about them next week. All right, so many of those places he's been, he writes back and he tells them what's going on. He tells them, you know, what God's telling him to tell them and, and he gives that to them and then we can learn from that. But this book that he writes to the church at Rome, when he writes this book, he had never been there. And in fact, if you read down, you just skim for the next few verses there in Romans below verse 7 there, what you're going to find, Paul's going, I want to come to you. I've been trying to come to you, but I'm being um, kept from coming to you. And, and you can tell that he wants to get there because it is an incredibly 
um, important place. That if you can get the gospel established there and that truth going out, it's going to go out further. And so Paul's going, I want to, I want to come. And all sorts of things. He's prayed about it. He wants to go, but God's not letting him go. And the people aren't letting him go. And nothing's happening that he can do. Uh, my guess is there's someone in here today that would say, I know I'm supposed to do something and I can't seem to make it happen. Anyone with me? You can raise your hand. Anyone just trying to get God? You just know God wants you to do something. It's not happening and it's frustrating. And that's where he is at this point. And he states that numerous times. What you will find as you study further about this, Paul does eventually get to Rome. Unfortunately, he gets there as a prisoner. He's brought there to stand trial. And God tells him he's going to have to do that. This doesn't sound like a good thing. This is not how you want to go to Rome. My guess is there are some of you sitting in this room today where what you asked for you got, and now you're sitting there, you're going, how can this be a good thing? I thought this was a God, and now it's like going from the, what do they say, the frying pan into the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now he is a prisoner on house arrest in Rome, chained to a guard. But here's what is unbelievable, and it just sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier when you begin to talk about how our lives and how our reflection on those who aren't with us. I mean, you're Paul, this guy that he's chained to. I just, I just don't picture this being like a good thing, being chained to some guy. I just get this feeling you just don't naturally like him. This is not a natural thing to be chained to another man. I just can smell his breath standing here. It doesn't feel like a good thing. But evidently, these guys that he was chained to were the Praetorian Guard. And evidently in that time, these guys are the uh, secret service of the king. They are the elite ones that would be guarding him. This isn't just any old prison guard that he's chained to. And what I learned about this Praetorian guard is that they are incredibly influential in that time. And there are about 10,000 of them. While Paul is chained to these guards, we are told that he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and Philemon. So you picture that. He's sitting there writing to these churches. And you've got this guy looking on. What do you mean by that? What are you trying to say? And what, what we believe is that the Apostle Paul treated these guys with the highest level of respect, love, and compassion. That he had a winsome way with, uh, about him that they couldn't help but being drawn to him and ultimately drawn to his message. I don't know about you, but that is so hard for any of us who are connected to someone, willingly or unwillingly, to try to, to, try to be that Christian in their midst. And that's what the Apostle Paul was. In the book of Philippians, you don't have to turn there, you're welcome to. Chapter 1, verse 12. Listen to what he says about this imprisonment. He says, I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Here's what we believe happened. Because of how he treated these guys, that these guys kept on coming and they're, they're guarding him and they're wanting to know more and they're just being drawn because how he's treating them and the message that he has, that they're going back and they're talking to the rest of them. And these 10,000 guards, the Praetorian guard, they hear about Jesus and they get saved. And because they're so influential, they begin to spread the word themselves and the gospel goes out in a way that Paul never could have had it go out had he just shown up in town with his little band of guys. 
God had a different plan. How do you move from, from being a prisoner to m- sitting with those who are the most influential in society? And Paul says as a result of that, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much bo- more bold to speak the word without fear. Sometimes... God uses the most crazy things in our lives, things that make no sense to us in the moment, to accomplish something that is what he wants. It looks like evil that that this man is preaching the gospel, and he has to go stand trial before Caesar, and he's under house arrest, and yet God says, I want to use it for my good. And this man realizes it, and he says, I'm not going to go down because everything feels like it's against me. I'm not going to become a victim. I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to shame. I'm not going to be unkind. I'm not going to be rude. I'm not going to curse out. I'm not going to fight for my rights. I have a mission. And I'm going to keep doing it because when he met Jesus, Jesus changed his life. Remember, nothing would be the same again. And he wanted everyone to know, and it was just flowing from him. Folks, I want you to hear that. If Jesus has changed your life, it it should change everything. So listen to what he says in chapter 1, verse 16. He says this, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And get this noise out of your head that says, you know, um, I, I, don't, I don't talk about politics or religion. Why? Open up your Bible and share with people. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He says, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone. And I want you to hear this word, who believes. That word believe is the operative word that, that makes salvation happen in your life. I keep on saying it. I can't say it enough. In front of you this morning, you have these cards. They're called Yes to Jesus. I said Yes to Jesus. Inside of them, they have the ABCs. B on this card is believe. You need to believe in Jesus, and we'll talk about that some more. He says, and everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, listen carefully, the righteous will live by faith. Here's the question, are you righteous? Well, what's the definition of righteous? Here's the definition of righteous. Right with God. Am I right with God this morning? Well, that, that, that just sort of begs the question, okay, so how can I be right with God? How can I know for certain I'm right with God? Was there anything ever wrong between me and God? What, what, what makes you say I'm not right with God? Why would I think that I'm not right with God? Look down just a couple verses to chapter 3, verse 20. Chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law, comes knowledge of sin. Now that word justified sounds like a big Bible word, and it is. But you'll you'll get it, easy. It, It doesn't take much to do it. So you go out today, and you make a big purchase. You come home, and you say to your spouse, look what I bought. And your spouse, knowing where you guys are at financially at this moment, gives you that look. And you realize at that moment, you are going to have to justify the purchase. Do you know what I mean? How do you justify that purpose? It was on sale. Everything's on sale always. Have you ever bought anything that's not on sale? 60%'s not even good enough. When someone goes, oh, I got this a great price. It was 60% off. That's like regular price, folks. I mean, I figure until it gets to be about 90%, it's not on sale. So you figure, I've got to go further because they're giving you that screwed up looking face going, I'm not sure about this one. And so, you, well, well um, it was on sale, and oh, I had a 20% off coupon. They always have a 20% off coupon off of everything. It's still not cheap. And, and you know what? I just felt like it's our anniversary. Well, yeah, it's our anniversary, but you know what? And I, I want to give it to you. Yeah, right. You bought that for you, and you're trying really, 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 really hard to justify this when you finally say, well, remember, we've been talking about this for about six months now. And remember, when we did our research, we found that the cheapest one is at this price, and I got it at this price, and your mate goes, oh, yeah, good point. I'm good. 
Thanks. That's, uh, thanks for seeing that. Sorry, sorry to question you so much. That's good. And at that point, it's resolved. You have justified this purchase to them. But it took a minute to do so. What Paul is saying here in this verse, he says, hey, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Listen, made right with God. No human being will be seen righteous with God. Here's the problem. Every other religion in the world has this mindset. If I start piling up all these good things, I'm a good person. I do nice things. I fill up shoeboxes. I give money. And we start building up this pile. We have a good family. And, and we just stack up that pile. Is that not good enough? And then pretty soon we move to things like, I've never murdered anyone. Well, yeah, I hope not. I've never committed adultery. We keep on going. We start li listing this off a little bit more. Well, I'm better than, like, a whole lot of the rest of the population. Then we sort of get mad as we start piling this stuff up. And we go, if God doesn't take me for who I am, then I don't even want to go there. Oh, man, getting a little bit snarly with the God of the universe. Not sure if I want to go there. Because what God says, clearly in this verse, by all these things that you do that you think are good things, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. I can't justify myself before a holy God that I am righteous. Paul says no one can do that, so keep on going. He says through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Look down to verse 23 of chapter 3. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. One sin is an offense against the holiness of God. And what Paul's going to say is that we have all fallen short. And because of that, all of us are lost. And quite truthfully, again, we talk about these ABCs. The A is this, I have to admit that I'm a sinner. Unfortunately, most of us will quickly admit yeah, you know, I, I, I messed up on some things. I've failed on some things. But, you know, again, I, I think I've done pretty good. That's depending on all of these works. The Bible is clear here. Through all the good things you do, you can't get there. You have sinned. That causes you to fall short of the glory of God. But look at verse 24. And by the way, if you got one of these cards, you're meditating on these very verses. These are like huge. Okay, verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a, is anyone reading along? And are justified by his grace as a, thank you. Did you have to earn it? Could you deserve it? It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. Period. Nothing I can do to earn it or deserve it. Now, how's that gift come to you? Why, why is that gift possible? It says here, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. The payment, it says here, will be by his blood. How are you going to get that payment? By faith. By faith. Here's the deal. Here's how it all gets justified. Start out with a question, just simple. Um, how can I be made right with God? That's God's righteousness. Found out I'm not right with him because I've sinned. So how do I get made right with God? God, through his son, Jesus Christ, is going to pay the price through dying on the cross. His blood would, would be the purchase price for my sins. I would exchange my sin for his righteousness. And here's what, justi uh, what it means to be justified. God is going to declare you righteous. If you put your trust in Jesus, you've been made right with God. You have been justified with God. He declares you righteous. That is justification. All right, my time is almost up. Let me, maybe my time's long up. I'm not sure. 
Let me just bust through this really quick. Does it feel like my time's up? I'm sorry. That's the worst part when you're sitting out there and it feels like his time's up. I told him to take the counter off the screens because um, some of you are looking up there. If you haven't fallen asleep yet and you're staring at the screens, you know you're in trouble. So we just talked about grace, this, this gift. Chapter 6 of Romans, um, Paul says, okay, so if this grace is a free thing and, and um, I'm depending on that and it's not about my works and all that kind of stuff, well, then should I just like let it all hang out, go sin, do whatever I want because God's going to forgive it. And in fact, the more I sin, the more God's going to forgive. And, and um, so here we go. And Paul says, no, 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 in chapter 6, no, don't let it be. Stop, 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 stop. And then in chapter 7, pa- uh, the apostle Paul gets really honest. And here's a guy that's written a better part of the New Testament. This guy is a huge, huge dude of the faith, okay? And in chapter 7, he gets really honest with us, and he says this. He goes, listen, I'm a messed up sinner. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't do, or the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And he screams out, what a wretched man am I. I am a mess. And you step back, really? If you're a mess, what about me? And, and, and there are those of us in this room right now, you have made a profession of faith. You put your trust in Christ. Today you go, I get it, Pastor. I believe that the blood of Jesus has covered my sin. I believe I'm righteous in God's sight. And yet Satan's whispering in your ear right now going, you are messed up. You remember what you did on Thursday? You remember what you said to your wife on the way in here? Do you know how it's gone with your boss at work? You are a loser. Satan's screaming in your ear. And in chapter 8, verse 1, the Apostle Paul helps us so much, and you've got to just take a peek at this really fast. Chapter 8, verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. So when the devil's whispering that ear in your ear, you repeat those words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And he goes on to explain that in chapter 8. If you haven't gone there, go there, memorize it, just pound it in your head. So when Satan says, you are too bad to come before God, you go, no, I'm not. Paul comes to all of that. And so then there's just one more thing I want to show you. Well, no, two more things I want to show you this morning. Chapter 10, you may be saying, okay, so how do I, how do I get there? You've got to underline these verses. Chapter 10, verses um, 9 and 10. It says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You want to know how to, um, how to be saved? How to have this right relationship with God? Here it is. It couldn't get any clearer in the Bible. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and you'll be saved. Then he goes on to explain, for with the heart one believes and is justified. God declares you, God declares you righteous. God declares you, that's what justification is. So he says here, with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And then he says this, for the scripture says this, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. I just say to you, church, this day, if you've never done that, I know, see, I know that in this room there are people who have been coming here for years. People are coming here for the first time this morning, and they're going, I want, I want to be right with God. You've tried all the works things, and every time you go, they give you one more thing to do, and you've done pretty good, but you realize I'm still empty, and I just have this hole. I want to put my trust in Jesus. Church, I beg you, today is the day of salvation. Trust in Jesus today. Just believe in him. You know, just right where you're at right now, I'm not going to make you do anything fancy. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. I believe in you. I trust in you. I, I believe you are Lord. I believe you died. You were buried, and you rose from the dead, and I believe that you'll put your righteousness on me. And the scripture says, you won't be disappointed. Your life will never be the same again. That's what we talked about with the Apostle Paul when that happens. Whether it's, a, you know, this big moment of, you know, like a lightning strike it was for him. Or whether it's just a quiet moment in this church. It's like, oh, wow, I am forgiven and I am free. One last thing, and then we will quit. Chapter 12, I think, is something that all of us need to think through. 
It is so huge, I couldn't not say it today. What's it mean to grow up in Jesus? It's one thing to be saved. What's it look like to, to commit my life to Jesus? Our, our ABCs are admit that you're a sinner. We've talked about that today. The B is believe in Jesus. And the C is commit my life to following him. I want to read to you Romans 12, 1 and 2 from a, what we would call a paraphrase of the Bible. It's called the message. This is someone taking the words of the scripture and sort of mm, illuminating them a little bit, adding a little color to them. So I want you to hear it, and then I'm going to read the ESV and we'll quit. So here, here, here's what, what, what it says in the message. This is Romans 12, 1 and 2. So here's what I want you to do. This is how you commit your life to God. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the very best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture um, around you that you fit into it without even thinking. He says, instead, fix your attention on God. He says, you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops maturity within you. That's what we're praying for. This is what we talk about all the time here at Calvary. That you'll be changed, you'll be transformed. Light, life's not going to be the same again if you'll just turn your everyday, ordinary life, and just everything you do, turn it over to God and give it to him. So let me read you these verses from the English Standard Version, which is what we um, teach from here. He says this, and I'll wrap up. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. That means, brothers means that you're saved. You've put your faith and trust in Jesus. If you're newly saved today, welcome to the family of God. We'd love to talk to you about that. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then he goes on, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, the good and acceptable and perfect. Lord God, oh, thank you so much for letting us be in this room right now. I pray that people in this room today have just given their life to you. And I pray that people in this room right now are challenged to follow you and just live it out every day. And that you'll just encourage us along those lines. Thanks for your writing us this down so we have clarity on how to be made right with you. We want to know that we've been justified, that we've been made right with you. Thank you for declaring us righteous. Thank you for calling us saints because of the blood of Jesus. We just praise you for the blood of Jesus. Now, Lord, we give back our offerings to you right now, and we know that it's not adding to the pile. We, we, we can't do that. We give it back because we love you. And we just want to give that piece of our everyday life back to you. So be glorified, God, as we give our gifts to you right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I sense that's what you want, church. That just excites me. And I would just say, for the last, I don't know what it is now, four weeks, we've been talking about Operation Christmas Child. You know we're joining thousands of other churches in this nation and businesses gathering together these boxes to help children all over the world. I think they told me some 10 million of these are going to go out. And you have brought in just an amazing amount of supplies to place into these boxes. We've had a team of like 30 people here every day for the last couple weeks getting those all organized so that after the next service, after at 12 o'clock, we can all get together and pack these boxes up. I would love for you to come back at 12 and help with that. So if you can, hang around or just come right back at 12 and help us with that. I was told this morning that we have barcodes that are going to go on each of these boxes. We'll actually know where they're going to go or where they went eventually. Inside of every one of these boxes, it'll be more than just um, physical gifts. There will be a pamphlet and a story that will give them the message of Jesus and the opportunity for follow-up. So we're going to pray over every one of these boxes. And here's what's cool. 
I'm told as of before service this morning, and so it may have changed by now because I saw many of you bringing stuff in, even again today, that we had enough materials to fill up at least 1,200 boxes today, church. Praise God. Thank you so much. So we just have one other thing to do. We got to get these to where they're going. And they tell me it costs about $7 a box to get them there. So if, if you have a little extra um, cash in your pocket today, would you just think on your way out, um, there are young people at every door, I'm told, with a box with a hole in the top of it. And you just slide it in there. If there's some kid out there just collecting money with his hands, probably not legit. So as you leave here today, if God would lay it on your heart to help get this box over there, that'd be awesome. Church, I love being your pastor. Have a great day. Be blessed.